Welcome to the Let the Stray Show, your one-stop destination for intriguing conversations with extraordinary individuals who are boldly navigating life outside the conventional norms. Our host, Scott Fullerton, is thrilled to embark on this journey of discovery with all of you. The Left a Straight Show, we believe that every person's story is unique, and it's our mission to showcase the diversity of human experiences. We bring you the untold stories of fascinating people who identify as LGBT plus and allies, pushing boundaries, breaking stereotypes, and making a positive impact in our communities. On this show, we bring you a diverse lineup of inspiring guests, from activists to artists, and entrepreneurs to entertainers, and everything in between. We dive deep into their personal journeys, discovering the pivotal moment that has shaped their lives and careers. You can expect thought-provoking discussions on a wide range of topics, from LGBTQ rights, social justice to arts, culture, mental health, and more. Our guests are change makers who share their insights, challenges, and triumphs, igniting conversation that promotes empathy, understanding, and love. So whether you're part of the LGBTQ community or an ally looking to expand your knowledge and show your support, the Love to Straight show is for you. Together, we can build bridges of understanding and acceptance, celebrating the beauty of what makes us all unique. So sit back, grab a drink, and get ready for the show. All righty, everyone. Welcome back to the Left of Straight interview editions. I'm your host, as always, Scott Fullerton. I pinch myself every day to be able to talk with some amazing celebrities and personalities from the worlds of entertainment, booties, books, music, and advocacy, all for our LGBTQ community and our fantastic straight allies. Today, I have the incredible pleasure of hosting the multi-talented Mike Manning back in studio for the third time. Of course, Mike is renowned American actor, producer, reality television personality, and activist who took the opportunity of the platform he made for himself on the MTV series The Real World and tuned it into an amazing list of achievements he's garnered garnered just in this short time so far. Mike has not only made a mark in the entertainment industry with his dynamic career, but also with his huge commitment to advocacy. His journey extends beyond the screen, showcasing his passion for making a positive impact in the world with causes like Buddha bullying, legacy youth leadership, and the Thirst Project, and all of this in his spare time from his day job of creating amazing television and movie characters with two Emmys to show for it, by the way, all from the humble beginnings of wandering the streets of Disney as Buzz Lightyear. Let's look back at the handsome and talented Mike Manning on the show, but first, take a look. Cueing the Manny to say, I got that. Ugh. That's why I always bring an extra muscle tea to work. You never know with this guy. <laughs> um, some of us are going out after a rehearsal. You should come. The rest of us, we're leaving. We're going back to Mobile and Union Springs and Dothan. What do you think our families are gonna do when we get there? Gonna help pick out the limb the clan's gonna hang us from. I know, it looks scary from where you're standing right now. That's why in your head, this is just some big game. You do not have the commitment of someone like Rosa Parks. I was in a terrible emotional state. My child had been ripped from I me. was your child too, damn it! I was your child too. And the Emmy goes to Mike Manning as Caleb McKinnon, the Bay. Um, thank you, mom and dad, uh, my grandparents, uh, for always encouraging this crazy, high-strung ADD kid uh, that he could be whatever he wanted to be when he grows up. Uh, Grammy, this is for you. Um, they had a very positive, very strong LGBT storyline. If there's one young person sitting at home that sees that on the screen and knows that they are worthy of that love and, uh, and deserving of that love and capable of that love themselves, then this whole season was worth it for me. So thank you, God bless. Step to the beat, I woke up today, canceled all my plans, and I stepped right outside with my guitar. All right, everyone, and there you got to see some of the highlights from my very special guest today. Mr. Mike Manning is in studio. Mike, how you been, my friend? 
I've been I've been doing well. Yeah, now that the the damn strike is over, we can all get back to work. Um, right. so I'm pretty happy about that. I am excited to have you back. I unfortunately reached out in the middle of you filming something else, but uh, well, we couldn't talk about much anyway at the time because there's just nothing going on between the writers and the actors. So congratulations on getting that settled. I know you guys have been voting on it since uh, yesterday from when we filmed it, but uh, it looks pretty decent so far, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm really proud of the union and uh, and a lot of the protections they gave us. I think that there needed to be a a reshuffling of um uh revenue from streamers i think that that was you know when netflix first hit the scene and they were uh given leeway under like either new media contracts or residual structures um i think that that was a long time ago now netflix is one of the largest entertainment companies in the world and actors need a piece of of that you know shows that are successful um, I think residual checks are the lifeblood of actors, and a lot of us rely on them throughout the year to to keep us going and not have to have you know three jobs. And um, and so I'm glad I'm really proud of the union for for holding steadfast for that for um, AI protections because I think that that's only going to be more of a of a topic as time goes on and technology advances. Uh, and so you know I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm proud of I'm proud of what we were able to accomplish as a union. It's just a great job of sticking together. I mean, I have a lot of friends in the industry, obviously, and a couple of more SAG captains. And, of course, Jerry Ryan from the Star Trek series was on pounding the pavement every day. I mean, it took a lot of commitment, a lot of strength to stick together like that. And I think it uh, hopefully will pay off in the end for you. I mean, we talk about health care. People would not be able to lose their health card left, right, and center because you had to have such stringent requirements in the way they paid things. So, yeah. Yeah. Very important. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to have you on. Like I think we had you on last time back in May of 2020 before the world went to hell, but you'd won your first producer Emmy at the time. So lots been happening since then. Yeah. Um, wow. I can't believe it's been that long. I didn't realize. It's, it's been, been a two years off. I mean, with the first years. year, everything shut down, obviously, and you guys, there's nothing to talk about. Second year, for me, it was just hard to get my happy but motivated. I mean, you have your fingers in so many things. As both producer and actor and advocacy, I'm sure you were probably on constantly busy, but it was still a little bit to get back in the swing of things, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I it, it, I kind of joke with some friends. Uh, so 2020 came around, and in January, I was like, you know what? I don't – something big is going to happen this year. I don't know what it is. But I have a feeling something big is going to happen. It's going to be great. And then the world shut down with a, a worldwide pandemic. And then 2023, this year – I started the year with, okay, you know what, like the entertainment industry, we're done licking our wounds from COVID. And, and I think like, this is, this is our year. We're going to come back at it. And then the WGA strike and the SAG strike shut the industry down for the entire year, basically. And so for 2024, I'm just like, you know what, 2024, just be nice to us. I don't have any expectations. I'm just going to try to work hard, be a good person, you know, like, and, and follow the news and make sure you'll see what's going on. But um, I have no expectations for 2024. Oh I don't want to have my heart broken again. Happen. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, we got the holiday season coming up here. Talk about, uh, do you and Nick do anything in town? Do you go back to Colorado? What do you guys do for the holidays? So we're going to uh, Colorado for Thanksgiving to see my family. And then for Christmas, we're going to spend time with his family in NorCal. And um, yeah, so we, we always we always switch off every year. So. Oh, very nice. Um, yeah, and I have some some nieces and nephews that are are now eight, seven, and three. The rest of them, um, and so they're getting to the age where they're becoming. They have their little personalities. They have their. Um, they're just fun. They're just fun to to. It's fun to watch them become little people. And isn't that uh, great? Yeah, and I'm excited cool. to see them. I love being able to kind of, that's what makes the holidays special, right? When you have to see it through your eyes and everyone's adults, it's not as much fun. There's a couple of good parties every once in a while to get to see your friends, but to see it through a child's eyes, that's where everything is really kind of comes together for the holidays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Absolutely. And is, what is Uncle Mike known for? Is is he the spoiler? Is he the, the fun person just to take out in the town or what does Uncle Mike do? Uh, I think I'm, I think I'm the spoiler. Uh, I'm also the, the one that tries to keep up the energy level. 
So I'm the first one that like, oh, let's play basketball or, oh, you want to, you want me to be a horsey? Get on my back. Oh, you want me to, so I think I'm, I'm the one that tries to match their energy level and uh, nice. it's getting harder and harder. <laughs> but, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but no, I, I love kids just for the same reason that you, you, you said, I think that it's fun. Uh, there's something really refreshing about experiencing things for the first time. And, um, and I just went to, I was in Florida. I went to a fan event for uh, days of our lives in Orlando a couple weeks ago. And I got to see my niece, my niece, Rayleigh and uh -huh. um, Ray Ray. And, uh, and she, uh, and I, and I got to see, what was it? It was universal city walk. And then she did Disney world and, and everything else. And, just to see a lot of the, those things for the first time through her eyes and see how excited she got and, and everything else uh, was, was, was amazing, was, was great. And, and, you know, I put her on, we did the piggyback thing and then we took a bunch of pictures and, um, and it was, it just, I had been there for so long because I worked, like you said in the intro, I, I when I was 19, I worked at Disney world. Um, I was friends with Buzz Lightyear and Pluto and, and a bunch of the characters. And after right. a while I was like, it, you know, some of the Disney magic died and it was like, okay, this is a job for me. Uh, but then to go back there in, in that area and see it through her eyes, somebody that I care about very much. Um, it was, it was awesome. It was great. I bet. Yeah. I just been recently doing a lot of interviews with some Pixar people that have a couple of projects coming out and it does, it makes you relive your childhood. Just kind of looking at some of those things and remembering that. So yeah, lots of yeah. fun. Well, and it's also fun too. It's like, I grew up watching Disney movies. I watch, I've right. seen every classic Disney cartoon a hundred times because it was, I watched them and then with my little brother and then with my little sister. And right. there's just a sense of, of wonder and magic and idealism about how the world works that I, I still try to hold on to despite right. certain political figures and things that are happening. I, uh, I just try to hold on to this belief in like the good of humanity and that if we all band together, we can create change and we can, you know, and, and I'm a hopeless romantic and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an idealist through and through. And I think that uh, Disney, especially with some of the newer shows that they have coming out and the newer uh, movies that they have coming out, it's nice to see them holding on to that idealism and holding on to that, like, you know, for kids and adults, like dreams can come true, like don't give up and everything else. <laughs> And it, it's a company that I'm really proud to work for. Um, when I first moved to LA, Disney was one of the first film jobs that I had. I did a show mm -hmm. called Crash and Bernstein, and um, where I played this Australian foreign exchange student. And then I did this Disney movie called Cloud Nine, and it was really one of the first big jobs that I had when I moved here. And um, and when that movie came out, I finally felt like I had I was earning my seat at the table. I was an actor. I was making a living at it, and 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 even at that point, I was proud to work at a company like Disney because, you know, it could get a lot worse than, than you know, than receiving paychecks from Disney. Uh, but they also exactly. had that, that idealism that was really sweet. No, it was so much fun. And like you say, you, if, when you can relive that, especially when you're an optimist, I mean, it's tough to be an optimist sometimes. We have some hard times out there that we go through. And uh, it, it's good to have those things to cling on to and to kind of bring you back to that happy place and get you centered again, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I hear you. Well, you talk about soaps. I mean, Days of Your Lives, you had a great run on that series. I mean, we've had such a lot of sad passings lately in soaps. I mean, we had we lost Jackie Zeman, of course. We're not we got Tyler. Um it was just um Jennifer Hudson's dad, I forget his first name. I mean Funny, interesting. Yeah. a lot of huge losses in the soap. I mean, they've been around forever, so a lot of people we've grown to love over a long period of time, but a lot of young people are passed away it's been very sad lately yeah i also worked with jackie zeman on the bay which is another series i do it's like this crime drama um on amazon and, and peacock and tubi and uh and i got to work with her more because i was never on her her soap but i you know i was on the bay with her and right. so i got to work with her pretty closely and she was just such a wonderful person a beautiful soul um and i went to her memorial service and was able to meet her family and really mm. uh see some of her other co-workers and, and other actors and and hear about stories about her just throughout her whole career just being a light to so many people and um and it was really it was a really nice reminder that that you could make a living in this crazy industry and still maintain your heart and maintain your soul and maintain your integrity and it was also a nice reminder to to uh, 
to sort of acknowledge the ripple effects of of doing good work and 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 being a part of a show that people watch or movies or telling stories because we sometimes forget sometimes the 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 enthusiasm sort of dies out and you think of it as a job but sometimes i have to kind of step back and pinch myself and say no i get to actually create stories that touch people and you know and promoting different ideas and different uh re- you know representation is so incredibly important for so many communities and um and so it was nice being a part of Jackie's journey in the end was a nice reminder of that That's such a nice tribute. I'm sure you know him, but I've had Ryan Carnes on quite a few times who worked with her in General Hospital. So uh, Ryan Carnes played uh, not her Mm -hmm. son, but one of the sons there. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, yeah, it's I've I've heard nothing but good things about her. Everyone had such a kind word. She was just supposed to be the loveliest person. So great. Ryan Carnes, wasn't he the hottie in Desperate Housewives like years and years ago? He was in that. He was in the original, the... um, uh, what were those goofy movies? The um, oh god, what were the movies called? Just oh, I know about you're talking movies. about. I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. those are them. Those are them. So yeah, no, Ryan Carnes. He's an amazing musician now. He's doing most of his time in music, but okay. uh, he's been on the show three or four times as well. And just a sweetheart of a guy as well. And worked on General Hospital and said the same thing. We talked about General Hospital a bit. And he right. talked about Jackie in such glowing terms. So I love seeing fellow coworkers really gather around your tributes like that. So well said on that, Brandon. I appreciate that. Thank you. You talk about pinching yourself. I mean, like I said, we've talked about it before in your previous interviews. I mean, back in the real world where you were really in the political thing, did you ever see you had the entertainment kind of desire, but did you ever see yourself to the level you're at now? I mean, it's gotta be kind of amazing. You know, I'll go back to that that Disney idealism. I so I grew up in Colorado, and I I was doing theater um, since I was you know 13 years old. I I just I loved doing theater. I loved um, you know play practice and everything. But I I grew up in a community where that wasn't really number one. I didn't really have any professional actors in my universe in my orbit. So right. I didn't even it didn't even dawn on me that I could actually make a living doing that. And also it was something that you know sports were valued over the arts in, in many cases. And so I would almost, I was a wrestler. I played hockey. I would almost, uh, like, like I would go to wrestling practice. I would shower off. I would shove my singlet in my backpack and I would run to play practice. And I didn't tell my wrestling buddies about play, but my theater, I wouldn't tell my, like, I wouldn't talk about wrestling to my theater buddies. And so I sort of had that separation in that world. It wasn't until college where I followed my best friend to an audition uh, to help him get on the show that I was, I, you know, I was cast on real world and that changed the trajectory of my entire life. And, um, and, and I, but I, but in a weird way, I remember to answer your question, I remember walking my dog when I was 13 years old. And I think I had just finished my second play or, or something like that. And I, I knew I loved acting. I'm walking my dog. Her name was Carly. Um, my childhood dog, she was a, a lab retriever mix. We're walking around the block in Colorado and I'm talking to her and I'm like, Carly, one day I'm going to move to Hollywood and I'm going to be an actor. And I just, I don't know why, but I just distinctly remember that moment. And, and I'm talking to my dog, but I'm, but I, I sort of knew, I, I knew that I felt claustrophobic in Colorado. I knew that I wanted to find a different place that I could be long and, and be myself a little bit more. And um, so I guess to answer your question, do, did I think that I, at this point in, in my life, I'd have two Emmys and be doing all this stuff? Uh, you know, probably not. And I have had a lot of those pinch me moments. Did I think that I would move here and give it my all and not stop until I felt like I had really, um, you know, done everything I could to sort of make it in this industry? Yes, I did. I felt like I would, I would do that. I made a decision a long time ago that I would probably be doing that. You've always been a driven person from what I've seen. Like even, like I said, when I came across you back in the show, you were very driven for advocacy, working for HRC back then and everything. And that's one of the things I really love. And I talk about every time you're on the show, you've kept that heart with you in combining the two worlds of advocacy and your acting and producing and everything like that. I mean, I remember we've talked about Kidnapped for Christ, you with Lance Bass, and of course with Tom DeSanto from X-Men. Mm-hmm. Um, Talk about your heart for that. I mean, you you just 
you give so much of yourself. It's got to be exhausting and fulfilling all at the same time. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Exhausting and fulfilling. <laughs> but I but I think also so much of this industry is exhausting. I think so much of the entertainment industry is based on, you know, nepotism and who you know, or the right place, right time, or, you know, waiting by the phone uh, for permission to be a part of somebody's movie or somebody's show or, so, you know, so much of it is out of our hands that I made a decision um, a long time ago that I was going to fill those, that white space, those, that time between projects and, and between waiting by the phone, I was going to fill that with projects that I felt good about. And that would sort of, you know, selfishly also refill my tank and refill my, my heart and refill my drive to keep going um, in, in terms of being a part of stories that mattered and felt like I was actually making a difference in my community. So, you know, I've, I've always had a heart for activism. I remember running for like student body vice president and Spanish honor society and honor society and red cross and all these things in like middle school and high school. I've just, I've always loved uh, being a part of things. And I, you know, maybe we, we hark, we can hearken that back to like that Disney idealism. I don't know. Um, but they haven't, they haven't killed it yet. They haven't, they haven't stomped out that idealism yet. And, you know, for instance, um, there was a project that I, that I was a part of that released, in 2020, um, I think around the last time we, we spoke, um, and it was called Lost in America. And it right. was a yeah, that was a huge cast. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. A documentary about homeless youth and with Ros Rosario Dawson, Halle Berry, John Bon Jovi, Tiffany Haddish, a film that I'm very, very proud of. One of the things I'm most proud of so far in my career, being a part of that film was extremely tough, extremely frustrating so many doors were slammed in our face because we were a low budget film talking about a subject that a lot of people didn't want to talk about. And, and also just watching that footage and watching the heartbreaking stories of, of youth that are dying on the streets that nobody's helping. It was, and I was a part of that film for five, it took us five years to, to cr create that film and to release that film. It was, it took a lot out of me, but at the end of the day, when I'm at the premiere watching the film and, and looking around and seeing the reaction of the audience members, you know, and, and the tears and the gasps and the, and, and being affected by the stories that we're telling, um, it was really cool. It was, it was really cool. And, and it was really nice to know. I don't know if I'm going to have kids. Uh, I'm still sort of on the fence, but I right. think at least on my deathbed, hopefully many, many years from now, I'll look back and I'll, and maybe my movies can be like the little, my children, like at least, right. you know, everybody wants to leave a legacy. And I hope that my legacy is, is, you know, being somebody that created stories that left the world. My grandfather always used to say, leave the world better than you found it. And, and I hope that my movies are going to do that. You do well, my friend. I mean, like I said, I was going to bring that up. Death and Life of Mar uh, Marshall Washington or Johnson and Marshall Johnson. Martha P. Johnson, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that. that I always kind of preach on the show about learning our history. A lot of people don't pay attention to the history. I think it's very important. And yeah. shows like that or any kind of documentaries or things like that, I think it's real important. The Black Cat documentaries, Stonewall documentaries, I mean, Harvey Milk, anything like that is really important for us to to learn for an LGBT stuff, let alone yeah. with our state yeah. allies, right? It's important yeah. for everyone. To know. Absolutely. I mean, what is the saying? If If we don't learn from our history, we're doomed to repeat it. And, so, and I think it's extremely important. I thought that I knew after living in D.C. and lobbying for the human rights campaign and, you know, in that journey that I had on the show, I thought I knew about LGBT rights and, and the evolution of, of sort of the civil rights for that community. And then I worked with David France, who was nominated for an Oscar for um, How to Survive a Plague. And then the film he did right after that was uh, The Death and, Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson. And in doing that film and learning about that history and, and um, sort of the, the trans movement and, and how that community has been on the front lines for, for decades for the entire LGBT community, um, you're absolutely right. I have a brand new respect for, I guess not brand new now because it's been a couple of years, but at that point I had a brand new respect for, uh, for our history and, and, um, and sort of how, how much people risked to give me the rights that I deserve today and give the younger generation the rights that they're deserving now. And, um, and also, you know, 
what happened in the, in the U S in the 50s, 60s, 70s is now happening in other places around the world. And there are people still being killed for, um, being LGBT. And so it's, it's, it's crazy. And I think that we can use that, um, the model of what worked to earn those rights and fight for those rights. We can use that to help other communities, I think, and other people that are being persecuted for, you know, for who they are. Very true. I mean, we can't give up. Unfortunately, everything, it's still happening everywhere. And it's something we have to watch out for. We've seen a very quick backslide in six years. So we can't let that happen. We have to keep aware of what's happening. I love even in your production companies, you kind of keep the faith and the enthusiasm. I don't know if you still run both. I remember, didn't you have at one time, yeah, Manifest Productions and Lucky Man Productions. I mean, it's just that positivity that I love. Uh, just you just keep it going all through your work. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it's Ma Manifest is the is the only one I closed down. The other companies, uh, Manifest is the company that I that I'm currently part of and uh, and running and and yeah, we try to we're trying to manifest some of that that those stories that positivity out there, Scott, because I think the world needs it. So I'm gonna keep doing it until somebody stops me. I agree. <laughs> Well, let's get into some of the current stuff. Uh, the slap was a little bit earlier this year. Uh, talk about that and uh, some of your current projects you have going on. Yeah, so Slapface came out uh, in last the beginning of last year, I think, and um, and that was I produced that with under my production company, and um, and that was a film, a horror thriller about a little kid that lives in the woods and and befriends a witch, uh, but it had a, a pretty strong anti-bullying message to it. Um, which I appreciated, and and it it was it released last year on Shutter, uh, which is basically like the Netflix for horror films, and uh, it was one of Shutter's best performing films of the entire year. I believe we still have uh, an eighty six percent on eighty six and like a ninety percent on Rotten Tomatoes, the critics and the choice uh, the audience award um, scores, which is phenomenal uh, to me. I think people are really connecting with the film and. Um, I'm trying to get, I haven't told anybody else this, but we're trying to get the sequel going for next year. So maybe fingers crossed, nice. uh, we're trying to do that now that the strike is over. And then, um, and then, yeah, I've, I've had a, a busy, uh, I think the last month has been pretty busy for me. The middle of October, I had a film come out, uh, come out called the bell keeper with Randy Couture. Um, and I was, I was an actor in that film. Um, and uh, and it's basically a story about college students. They go to a campsite. It's haunted. We all get possessed. Randy Couture kills us. You know, but it's, it's one. It is what it is. Uh, but but I got to work with my buddy Colton Tran, who directed that. And I met Colton when I did that Disney movie Cloud Nine. So it was fun to sort of make a movie with. And a lot of the cast members are friends of mine. Um, uh, um, what's his name? Um, Reed Miller from Joe Bell that story with oh, Mark yeah. Wahlberg uh, that was about a kid, you know, coming out and, and confronting his sexuality um, that he was, he played my little brother in the film. So that was really cool. Kathy Marks from Sque Scream Queens, um, who I've done a couple projects with. She played my girlfriend and that was cool. And then mm -hmm. uh, let's see. And then I had a film called Engagement Dress that just came out last week on Tubi. Um, that's a little romantic comedy. So, and I was the lead of that film and, uh, and it's fun. It's, 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 that has the idealism and the romance turned up to a, an 11 and uh, yeah. it was, that was a, a sweet film. People can find that on Tubi and, um, and then, and Rachel, um, uh, Rachel Annette Helson was the director of that one. She's also a fantastic actress and, uh, and she was, she was great. And then, um, and then what's my other movie? I know I have, oh, The Dirty South. So the Dirty South, I was an executive producer on uh, Dermot Mulroney, Shane West, Willa Holland, and that one is very much a gritty crime drama, and uh, yes, yes. and I yeah and I and I and I play um, a, a jerk frat guy <laughs> in that one. <laughs> so so kind of, yeah, kind of they. I'm being typecast, Scott. I'm being typecast. <laughs> Was, That's was, why I reached out to you last month because you've done so much horror in the wild. I thought it'd be fun to have you on Spooky Season when you were in Thailand. Yeah, no, the, the time is of horror stuff. Yeah, so the, I, I love I love horror. I absolutely love horror. I grew up watching 
uh, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street and, and Friday the 13th and Halloween. And I love practical horror. And, um, and so, you know, I love spooky season every year. Um, oh, also the Bay, I forgot to mention the Bay. So the Bay is, is nominated. It's a show that I've been a part of since season five. We are, they're releasing, uh, season eight next month. In... Let's take a break and show everyone a quick clip of it. And then we'll talk about it on the other side. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, guys, this is my very special guest today, Mr. Mike Manning's in studio, and this is a great show. If you've not seen it, it's called The Bay. We'll be back in just a couple seconds. There we Daniel, go. today is uh, it's the best day of my life because today I get to marry my best friend. When we met, Back in high school, I didn't ever think that that was going to be possible. The world wasn't ready for our kind of love. And if I'm being honest, neither were we. <laughs> but here we are now. No, no. <laughs> You are joined as one. Daniel Garrett and Caleb McKinnon, by the power vested in me, by the state of California, you are now married. <laughs> you may now kiss the groom. I love that. I mean, we got to talk about the show because one of the things I love is you won an Emmy for being a producer. Then mm -hmm. you go on as an actor, win an Emmy as an actor. Congratulations on both of those. Was that a different, were you still producing when you were acting? Did you have this different kind of camaraderie with the cast then? Were you an on-set producer? Were you an off-set producer? Talk to me about how those came to pass. Yeah, so I joined the, the show in season five as an actor, and I met the creator at a, a, an event. And it was it was kind of one of those moments where the stars aligned. He he said to me, hey, Mike, uh, I have been looking to cast this, this character, and you're kind of perfect. Let's have a meeting. So we had a meeting, and, um, and, it, and it worked out, and it was, it was great. And then... Um, and then I also joined the show as a producer, more behind the scenes, more in terms of like packaging and, and bringing assets to the show. I wasn't the guy running around on set doing that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, in season five, I the show won best uh, best show. And so I won an Emmy as a producer. And then in season six, uh, I was I won an Emmy as an actor, not as a producer. I wasn't a producer at that point. I was an actor. Um, and then I won an Emmy as Best Supporting Actor for my character, Caleb McKinnon, on the show. And that was really special to me because I won an Emmy portraying a character that was going through his own journey of accepting his own sexuality. And, right. um, and so it was really, you know, I said this in my Emmy speech, it was really sweet to know that there could be audiences watching the show and seeing the, the journey of my character. And my character really goes from in the beginning, kind of like real world. In the beginning, I <laughs> didn't know what I was, he didn't know what he was doing. And he's like, I right. think I have feelings for my best friend. I don't know. And then you see in, in, in season six, um, I'm sorry, in season five, it was, I don't know what I'm doing. Season six, they sort of fall in love and they go through, uh, their arc is is the end of season six. They're getting married, and in the scene when I'm getting married, I'm actually wearing my real suit that I wore to my own wedding, and so it was one of those moments where life imitates art, kind of thing. And and it was really it was really sweet. And and so to win an Emmy is is amazing, and to have the little golden statue, you know, is great. But also to win it for something that you're proud of and a storyline that you're proud of 
is icing on the cake. So it was it was a great um, it was great. Well, congratulations. Well deserved. And that's one of the things I love about you. I mean, all the times I've had you on the show, we've kind of talked about it. Your your advocacy for being part of bisexual, gay community, whatever it is, has always been in your works and not in the voices, right? I remember at the time you won the Emmy, you thanked Nick and everyone thought that was a big reveal. It's like people are kind of new, kind of new. It's like you don't have to talk about it, right? And it's just nice that you're able to live your life out and proud the way you want to live it, whether it's however it is, just acknowledge it and you do it in your deeds. So that's what I love about you, my friend. Congratulations. It's worth every bit of the award on there. Believe me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, some, some people ask why I'm not more um, sort of in your face about it. And, and I think that there is a space for that and there's a time for that. And there have been times where I've been very outspoken and very, um, you know, uh, aggressive almost about, um, when I when I when when I feel like people are attacking the LGBT community, you know, if if they try to bite me, I bite back. But I think there's also a power in just living one's life and living a life with integrity and and with you know in a relationship and having a commitment and you know a house and the dogs and the you know just kind of being boring and kind of just trying to show the world that you know hey we're just like everybody else and I think that there's a power in that. So I you know. Like you said, I, I try to let my work speak for itself and I don't hide anything. Um, but I also just try to live a life that's that's normal and, and boring just because I think I, I'm allowed to. I think I deserve that as well. Exactly. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> no, I love it. Like I said, I've, I've, I've been following you as a fan since the show. Um, I've been lucky to talk to you a couple of times. I mean, just in your photographs on Instagram and stuff, you have the dogs, you have uh, just, a, just a family, right? It's just who we are and just enjoying life. And you deserve every second of it, my friend. I love it. Thank you. It's fantastic. Well, last thing I want to talk about, and we'll, we'll kind of move on from here. I don't want to keep you too long. But I had my buddy Jason Caceres on the other day. He's been a good friend for a long time. And you guys have, he's talking about you being the lead in a new uh, project called the Psionicum or something. It's, it's like superhero freaky, which I love. Talk about that project. What can you say about that so far? So I don't know what I'm allowed to say about that. <laughs> Um, right, well, Jason didn't tell me much either, so I didn't know if I'd be okay, able to get okay. more or not. Okay, okay. I, yeah, yeah. I don't. I, All I, think I know I, is you're the lead. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm one of the leads of the show. Um, I have superpowers, which is really cool because I'm a huge sci-fi nerd, and and I really wanted to play um, uh, a superhero. So he's not necessarily a superhero, but he has superpowers, and I think he's sort of discovering the type of person he wants to be with those powers which is which is fun um and in they're pretty cool superpowers and uh and and i hope the show goes it's a pilot and as you know you know pilots are shot all the time and they never see the light of day so you know i'm hoping that um that the show is successful and it finds a home and i get to be that that superhero again that would be fun we'll have you back on if that happens i'd love that that'd be great Please. I love those kind of shows. I'm a huge sci-fi superhero. All of, I mean, it's kind can, of irreverent. It's kind of like The Boys or the new spin-off. I like that. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like that. It's it's everybody's superheroes, but or not superheroes. Everybody has abilities, but not right. all the abilities are necessarily great. And um and and not everybody is necessarily great with those abilities. So it's kind of it's fun. It's it's realistic. It's um, it's basically like, what if you took a college, uh, like Professor X's Xavier School for the Gifted X Men kind of thing, but right. if you gave them powers that not, are not necessarily great, uh, for some <laughs> of them, and then also to, gave it to people that are like not great people, like what happened? And uh, and so that's and it's it's in the vein of, well, it has it has like some dark comedy to it, which is which is fun. That's a great premise. I love that. Yeah. We'll wrap it up with a couple of questions. I reached out to some of my listeners the other day, and let's uh, let's answer those, and we'll get you out of here. Reflecting back, this is from Mike in San Diego. Reflecting back on your career, what project or role holds a special place in your heart, and why? Oh wow, um, there are so many. I mean, I think like we talked about Lost in America, the documentary about homeless youth. 
has a special place in my heart. Um, I think uh, Days of Our Lives has a special place in my heart just because I was on the show for so long and, and really got to work with some amazing people. And um, the, the Bay has a special place in my heart just because not only because of the Emmys, but because of the, um, the LGBT storyline that I'm really proud of. Um, Slapface has a special place in my heart just because I, it was the first time that I took a script from soup to nuts. I, you know, I, I helped rewrite the script and I helped produce it boots on the ground. I helped sell it. I, you know, I really did everything on that film and, and, um, and it was crazy, but it, I was really happy when we released it and it got the recognition that it did. And I don't know. It's like, it's like, it's like you can't pick your favorite kid. You guess, I guess. Right. I, I hear you. Yes. No. Those are some great examples. Uh, Nancy in Michigan asks, how do you see the intersection of entertainment and advocacy contributing to societal change these days? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think that art throughout history has helped contribute to societal change in positive ways, in opening people's minds to new ways of thinking and being and empathy. And I think that film and television uh, is, is a form of that, is a form of art. It's the same thing as somebody listening to a song and becoming moved. I mean, people go to the movies or they turn on the television to see themselves in characters, to either be moved or for escapism or to just simply see somebody going through the same things they are so that they realize that they're not alone in the world. And I think right now in society, we are becoming more and more divided than ever. And, you know, that's sort of, uh, that's, that's a sad reality. But I think at the same time, there are creators and creative types that are trying to use art to bridge that gap and to remind us that we're all, you know, doing the best we can on this giant rock that we're all living on. And, um, and that we're, and inherently, I think that we all want to do good and, and to, um, to, 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 you know, feed our families and to be successful. And you know, we all have the same wants and needs. And I think art is trying to bridge that gap and remind us that we're more alike than we are different. Great answer to a great question. Very well said, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. All right, my friend, we're going to wrap this up. What's uh, on the Mike Manning bucket list? Anything that you're looking forward to? I mean, you've directed a few things. You've produced a lot of things. You've acted in a lot of things. Anything, any property you're trying to get a hold of? Anything, you, any fun thing? What's what's on the bucket list? Uh, I really want to play a superhero next year. So whether that's a movie or a show or, you know, possibly this pilot that we talked about, uh, seeing the light of day. I don't know, but I wanted I want to play. I love sci-fi. I love comic books. I've been reading them since I was little. I really want to play a superhero. So let's put let's manifest that. Let's put that out into the world. There you go. Good answer. I love it. Mike Manning, thanks for coming back to the show. We have to have you back again. It's always a pleasure talking to you. You're really an inspiration. All you do advocacy-wise, and you're just such a positive talent in the entertainment industry and such a positive outlook. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. All right, stay on the line for me, guys. We're going to have a special five questions with Mike next Tuesday. Be sure to look for that. We appreciate you tuning in as always, and we'll see you next week. You're listening to the Left of Straight Show right here on the Left of Straight Radio Network. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Left of Straight Show. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast distributor and please give us a five-star rating so more listeners can find us. You can follow us on social media and be sure to check out our website, www.leftofstraightradio.com for contests and other news and information. See you next week.